Шановні колеги, давайте перейдемо, оскільки у нас конференція транснаціональна, я вам вже казала про те, що різні континенти, представники різних континентів приймають участь в нашій конференції. Now we are moving on to some more international participants. I've told you already that we have quite a big, a wide international scope of today's conference, so we are moving on further. Це різний час, це різні форми зайнятості наших спікерів. Тому, будь ласка, давайте переходимо до надзвичайно цікавих доповідей. Now, due to time differences and everything else connected to it, we are now proceeding to absolutely fabulous reports of our colleagues. Наші спікери – це дійсно люди, які в усьому світі творять громадянську науку в бібліотеках. Our would-be speakers are those people that are internationally recognized experts in promoting citizen science. Дарн Кавальє, професор, засновник Сайстартен, Аризонський університет, Сполучені Штати Америки, Сайстартен – це науковий портал та дослідницька платформа, яка заснована Дарвін Кавальє, і Дарвін – вона автор серії книг про роль громадянської науки. Професор з Аризона університету, один з кооставерів Сайстартен проєкту, promoting uh, citizen science and author of several books on citizen science. Now she is going to deliver a brilliant report. Uh, her, uh, her presentation is pre-recorded. І в нас будуть ще питання, які з'являються в нашому чаті. Ще хвилиночку, шановні колеги, наші учасники, а саме Дарвін Кавалія, вона говорить дуже швидко, тому якщо ви не будете встигати прослухати відповіді нашого перекладача, то знайте, що завжди ви можете передивитися всі виступи наших спікерів на YouTube-каналі бібліотеки. In case our next speaker talks too fast for you to understand, don't forget that we have all recorded presentations on our website, so you can always access them. So I am going to talk a little bit about uh, the work that we're doing in the United States with libraries. And so our first uh, slide here is looking at our title. The next one, if we can move down is the agenda for our talk, which will be shared with Robin, my colleague. We'll look at an overview of citizen science, an overview of SciStarter, what this program is called, which is Libraries of Community Hubs for Citizen Science, um, how you can get involved and leverage a lot of researches and then leave time for questions. So the goals are to identify, to help you identify ways libraries catalyze and support lifelong learning through citizen science, to help you find key strategies for introducing and scaling citizen science through your library or a library that you wish to work with, um, find resources at your library to help catalyze research you may be doing, or you may represent a community-based organization, or you might be a, a representing a library. So all three of those audiences can be served through these and other resources. And then of course, we wanna learn from each other. We'll be presenting about citizen science and libraries, and then you'll hear from another speaker who will talk about another form of public engagement in science through libraries. Citizen science, the global movement that enables people from all walks of life to actually advance scientific research. We basically help people take things they're curious or concerned about, and we find ways to connect them to actual research that needs their help. So they learn, by getting involved in the citizen science projects, but the projects use the data to advance areas of research. Um, together, this is how people can make an impact locally, even if they're involved in a global project. Citizen science is known. This has been validated and there's evidence for this. Citizen science helps increase long-term environmental, civic and research interest representative uh, representation of people traditionally not involved in science, technology, engineering, and math. 
um, increases your confidence in being part of science, the science, scientific enterprise, your confidence in understanding how to um, collect data and analyze data, um, increases in science learning and science literacy, domain knowledge, so learning more about the actual content um, of the projects you got involved in, and um, increasing scientific progress, because again, somebody's using that data to answer questions they wouldn't be able to answer alone. Many federal organizations and other organizations support the movement of citizen science. This is a, just a slide to show you some of them. Citizen Science Asia, Australian Citizen Science Association, Citizen Science Association in America, European Citizen Science Association. There's a federal crowdsourcing and citizen science act from the White House of the United States and more. So if you're new to citizen science, you might be surprised at looking at these numbers. The chances are you know somebody, or perhaps you are a citizen scientist. This first um, image here is of a very popular tool called eBird. This is an app people download and they use it to organize and ca um, categorize different types of birds that they are watching. So they're kind of using it as a checklist and for using that app, they give permission to share their observations with scientists who use that. In January, there were 1.5 million reports from citizen scientists through eBird. That's one month alone. And these are actually a little dated. I need to update these. Um, in the United States, there's an estimated one and a half million people who volunteer to keep an eye on our nation's rivers, streams, and lakes. They are citizen scientists. They're out there, they're reporting data, and it's shared by scientists and policymakers and others. Then there's um, a type of project called SETI at Home. This is a, a more passive version of citizen science where people download software and they allow their computer spare processing time to look for signs of life in space. Because of citizen scientists, much research has been accelerated. In this example, the amount of time that it took professional scientists to classify online images. So these could be um, uh, you know, pictures, these could be videos, these could be audio files. Typically grad students are sifting through these and looking for patterns and looking for things. And the amount of time it took them to, to do that, it took citizen scientists three months. So cutting 18 months down to three months. And there's a lot of checks and balances in terms of making sure that the data is um, valuable, that it actually is high fidelity, good quality. So this particular project looked at online um, images of cancer cells. And so these were just volunteers. 10 people had to say and see the same thing for one slide for it to be considered research grade. That's 10 times more than the one graduate student. So a lot of examples of how citizen science is accelerating scientific research. This only helps, uh, this only happens with well-designed projects, by the way, that have support structures in place. We can go over that later too. Um, uh, going back to 2014, my colleague at the University of Washington did a um, report to see what the financial benefit is of citizen science. And looking at 338 projects in one domain, this was in um, ecology, she found that the volunteers there, 1.3 to 2.3 million citizen scientists had an economic value of $2.5 billion a year. That's in the amount of time, some of that by saving uh, time for that graduate students would have been doing some of that work. This does not replace graduate students. This just helps make them more efficient and effective. Citizen science is serious science. Because of citizen scientists, we know, this was a lot of this was from my colleague, Karen Cooper at North Carolina State University. We know that bird po populations are declining by 50%, that birds are breeding earlier. We know more about bacteria that lives in your belly button because people have swabbed their belly buttons and sent the microbes, um, followed protocols and sent the microbes back to North Carolina State University where they were analyzed. Uh, we know that um, we are accelerating research on Alzheimer's disease by playing online video games is actually accelerating research. So what happens now with SciStarter? SciStarter is a place for people to find these opportunities. There are thousands of scientists and others looking and seeking help from the public. Um, and that's basically because they can't be everywhere. And it's not just scientists. These may be um, uh, nonprofit organizations or or others, you know, very engaged community members who have a who have a question that they need answered. And so you might, as a scientist, you might be um, collecting information about dragonfly swarms, and you're located somewhere where you can't be everywhere to go collect information about dragonfly swarms. You might create a citizen science project 
and then add it to SciStarter. I wanna point out this URL here at the bottom, SciStarter.org forward slash library. For any librarians tuning in, that's a very good place to get lots of free resources that you can customize and use um, to introduce citizen science and more. We'll get into that in a little bit. Millions of people enjoy science and nature. Thousands of scientists, as I just described, are looking for them. They can't always find each other. And this is basically where SciStarter comes in. You'll find an advanced search to look for things by grade level, um, activities, topics, location, um, whether or not they have classroom materials, whether they require instruments or tools. And we have hundreds of projects that are SciStarter affiliates. So even though you typically find a project and then leave, and go right to it. Many projects use APIs to report back to SciStarter when people are actually um, contributing data to their projects. And what that does is make it a very valuable research platform tool for everybody involved in citizen science, for project leaders. SciStarter becomes a very um, efficient way of amplifying your project, reaching the right audiences, um, learning more about your participants, better understanding their uh, movement and behavior in terms of other interests they have in citizen science, all while increasing um, data to help accelerate your research. Smart, efficient way to basically help um, uh, decrease infrastructure costs for recruiting people. Um, organizations, these are just some of the organizations that SciStarter works with. We help their community members just become more comfortable and find the right project for them to do to get whatever um, incentive was in place for them. For the Girl Scouts, that's a batch. For Verizon, that's volunteer hours, two hours a year of volunteering. They do that through SciStarter. Um, for some, it's a, a school or a university. Projects are actually assigned as part of classwork. And so SciStarter is able to provide evidence that people are engaged in those projects too. Um, and researchers, we have a number of researchers who use the platform to better understand the learning outcomes, the social dynamics, the behaviors, the interests, where gaps exist in opportunities to get involved versus where there are a lot of people looking for ways to get involved. So the platform is very simple looking on the front end, pretty complex on the back end. So we noticed that because of the data we're able to look at here, we could see that many projects were saved or visited, but we weren't seeing people contribute to some projects. So we spent some time doing a research project to better understand the characteristics of those particular projects. Why weren't people actually engaging in those projects they seem to like? Um, part of that is because if the project required an instrument, any kind of instrument, something not easily found around the house, somebody wasn't going to do it. That was a big barrier to them. It wasn't worth the time and the investment to go get those instruments to get involved in a volunteer project you may or may not like. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that aside for now because that really helps shape our work with libraries. But two other things that we, we learned and discovered is that citizen science can be very socially isolating. Even though we say, and we use words like community, um, really you're doing these projects by yourself by and large, not always. There's a lot of great opportunities to get together with people to do the projects, but mostly these are designed for an individual to do these projects alone. And then I mentioned the lack of access to the instruments and so forth. This is where we realize libraries hold the key to solving actually both of these projects problems or at least addressing them. One is by being a safe meeting space for people to come together, to learn about citizen science, to learn about projects in their neighborhood, do projects together, discuss the results and figure out a way to take action locally. Then it, the library also becomes a place where people can get additional reading materials to learn about a topic, but they can also now actually check out physical kits that have instruments and tools and materials in them. So they have everything that they need to get involved in a project. So what we do at SciStarter and this project in particular with Arizona State University, thanks to support from, from the Institutes of Museum and Library Services and the Moore Foundation is to look at ways to lower the barriers by empowering and supporting libraries as community hubs for citizen science, making sure that libraries have a way to disseminate um, resources and tools and instruments and so forth, but also making sure that the librarians themselves and the staff are well supported to take this on. And I believe, well, two more slides and then I'm gonna pass it to Robin. Uh, we have a whole five, six, seven year program now where we specifically are looking 
to scale our work to support libraries as community hubs for citizen science. What you see here are two women in a library looking at one of the kit materials that, that is an actual kit there. And this one is, is teaching them how to monitor light pollution. Light pollution has a lot of residual effects from um, disrupting your sleeping habits, but also those of animals, uh, migration paths, nesting habits, mental health, waste energy. So we have kits now that are in libraries that can be used for people to help keep an eye on where light pollution is happening and then help to guide them on what they can do to reduce light pollution. This is just a quick snapshot of the project started as a small pilot project in Arizona, which is where Arizona State University is based, six or so libraries, and then it quickly scaled throughout the state. So that was very interesting to see. We made some iterations on the kits, on the training programs, on the marketing materials, on supporting the librarians and so forth. Um, we had Citizen Science Day, which then turned into Citizen Science Month every April. Uh, we had a national expansion last year. So uh, that began with 10 pilot uh, libraries across the country, and it's grown to become more than 350 libraries across the country. And now I'm gonna pass it to my friend and colleague, Robin. Колеги, щиро дякуємо Дарвін Кавальгі 